Last week, we sort of built a little pedestal upon which to stand man, and now we have to go to work on the image which is to surmount this pedestal. Let us then begin uh, with one or two terms that we're going to need in principle, whether we refer to them often in words or not. In Indian philosophy, we have a term jiva, J-I-V-A, which is an Eastern name to signify the universal life principle. Now, this universal life principle naturally exists in innumerable conditions, and it also exists unconditioned. The term jiva primarily relates to the unconditioned source of this life. In other words, the universal life principle itself, or eternal existence manifesting as infinite life. There is another term, prana, P-R-A-N-A, which is derived from the study of the principle of jiva. Prana corresponds essentially to the life energy or life agent operating on the level of a material creation. Therefore, it is a phase, an aspect, a condition of jiva. Prana may be likened, perhaps, to the sustaining vitality by which everything is nourished and maintained in a functioning condition. Without prana, it would be as though electricity was turned out of a circuit, or a whole group of machines dependent upon it were left without it. The entire mechanism of organic life would cease without prana. And the great problem that exists in nature is the distribution of this through the organisms of created things. Prana is obviously a degree of energy far more attenuated than physical matter. And everywhere in Eastern philosophy we realize that irreconcilables do not suddenly come together. In order to bridge vibratory intervals, structures have to be created. Bridges have to be built. And in the case of man, these bridges are bodies by means of which he is able to capture, hold, and distribute various conditions of the universal life around him. So most essential and immediate to the need of man is a vehicle or body called in the Indian languages the Linga Sarira, by means of which prana or energy can be distributed not only to the physical economy of the human being, but also to sustain all other activities as emotion and thought. Actually, of course, it is not quite correct to say that one energy supports all of these. It is correct to say it in principle, just as we may say that jiva, or the eternal life, supports all living things. But energy, in order to be useful, must be conditioned or channeled and must be variously modified in its functions in order to be assimilable to the various levels of activity. So man possesses a fourfold nature, and this fourfold nature must be nourished, must be kept in a constant state of vitality. Therefore, a fourfold bridge has to be created. And this fourfold bridge is composed of what the Western esotericist as termed the vital body. This is the body by which vitality is channeled. And the function of this body is obviously important to all of us. And wherever we have devitalization, we have obstruction in the motion of vital energy through the body. Now when we recognize vital energy, we are easily convinced but it represents a principle of activity. And yet there is one phase of vital energy which apparently does not demonstrate 
activity as we know it and depends for its definition upon molecular activity that is activity within itself this particular form of energy we have termed hypothetically physical ether now physical ether or chemical ether is possessed of one attribute by which it may be recognized it is a principle which holds or binds things therefore the primary function of this particular form of energy is that things shall have an existence in the material world in other words all of the minute particles for example which compose the body of man are held together because of this hypothetical medium in which they are immersed and by which the principle of cohesiveness is maintained if this principle is withdrawn from a body as occurs in death the body slowly but inevitably disintegrates or if it is preserved as in the case of the egyptians then this body gradually turns back to an organic substance becoming almost as it were a stone now a stone however must also have some kind of etheric binder otherwise it could not even exist and every material structure exists because of a cement that holds the infinitesimal parts of it together now in the case of the human being the lowest manifestation of energy is this cohesiveness this power which maintains and organizes structure so that structure does not disintegrate and this living substance must have an existence as a structural archetype prior to the formation of the physical body because the body does not produce it the body is merely dependent upon it we told you last week that the body is not a principle therefore that essentially it has no dimensional functions of its own it is a receptacle of principles it is therefore first of all held together by a physical ether which forms so to say the cement and this cement keeps the structure in an appearance and in a type and in a kind it also supplies certain nutrition to the minute particles of matter which are not directly nourished by the ordinary methods of sustenance that we know it is therefore a living material in which structure develops and grows but the first and primary nature of it is unchanging this etheric element chemical ether has no important changes in it during the lifetime of an individual its nature is not subject to change because change represents another type of activity which this ether does not naturally possess it is almost like a great sea which supports innumerable lives but the bulk or substance of the sea is apparently eternal and unchangeable we are further further told in the eastern philosophies that this material if by any circumstance it is destroyed or injured that it may to a measure restore itself but will leave scarification <coughs> this is therefore the actual reason why physical scars remain on the body because the damage to the ether is never repaired completely the flesh might grow together but as the ether constitutes the archetype or the mold and determines the condition of matter the etheric scar will remain and will result in its image or reflection upon the physical body now we know for example that by surgery today particularly plastic surgery we can remove the visible signs of scars but in the ether the original scar is not changed because this substance does not change the you know, the old uh, satirists including paracelsus pointed out uh, that the ether 
is not subject to injury in very many ways, but that it is subject to injury by sharp instruments, and that cuts, or any uh, injury caused by sharpness, will sever or injure the etheric structure, because it is so close to the physical that it uh, responds to certain physical conditions. <coughs> so this ether, then, must have a natural and proper vehicle for its manifestation. It is particularly and closely associated with the mineral life of nature, and therefore uh, it is naturally associated with the mineral content of the human body. Its particular abode in man is in the marrow of the bones, and that is the reason why certain ailments or injuries which affect the marrow in the bones will ultimately lead to pernicious anemia, which is the loss of the contact of this ether. This ether, however, has tremendous recuperative power in the sense of continuance, because we have to remember that behind it is a tremendous universal energy field. And that this energy field, like all parts of nature, is striving constantly, instinctively, and perhaps without realizing the fact, not because of conscious intent, because of inevitable circumstances, is constantly seeking perpetuation, preservation, and the fulfillment of its own peculiar mission or purpose in existence. Now man, having a physical body that is held together by this etheric material, this becomes naturally the beginning of the study of the Linga Sharera in man. It is the beginning of the study of the vital principle, as this is manifested to him through means of what has been called the vital body. We must study, then, this body this evening, and try to understand many of its peculiarities, its wonders, and its reasons for existence, and its inevitable need in the compound of the individual. Man consisting of certain superphysical attributes, powers, of which the most uh, familiar to most of us is the mind. The mind, we know, is in some way associated with the brain. We know, however, that mind and brain are not identical. We know, consequently, that there must be a link between the mind and the brain. We also know that man possesses a powerful emotional nature, which extends from the highest and most sublime of spiritualized emotions uh, to the most material propensities of karma or desire. We know also that emotions do not arise within the body, but are imposed upon it from the kama rupa or emotion body of man. That this body cannot have a direct contact with its material physical centers or its centers of distribution into objectivity. The third principle that we recognize in connection with man is a compound of several things. One of these, and the most basic, is motion. Another, almost equally basic and certainly as inevitable to the survival of man, is generation or reproduction. And we observe that these are introduced into the phenomenal life of nature in the plant kingdom. That the plant kingdom, while it does not usually possess the power of motion, except in the case of the sensitive plant and certain others, that it does possess the power of generation. Therefore, generation becomes one of the attributes of the second or vital ether principle. The power to generate is not inherent in the physical body, and there could be no perpetuation of the species unless a vital principle of generation was united to the material structure of the body. There could be no emotion unless a vital principle or nutritional emotional agent united emotion to the physical emotional distribution centers. There could be no thought unless the mind was connected or bound to the body, the brain, by means of an emotional, uh, by means of a vital field of energy. Thus we observe gradually 
that four vital fields are necessary in order to maintain the compound of man as we know him today. There is first the chemical field of vitality, by means of which the body is held together or kept into a unified structure. The second is the vital power to reproduce, uh, to grow, to extend the body from one condition of its own development to another, as in the case of the tree which grows over a great period of time. The power also to have certain conscious or at least subconscious associations with the principle of life. Well, we know, for instance, that ivy planted in a dark place and separated from the light by a series of torturous chambers or passageways will instinctively develop and grow through these twisting passageways until it finds the light. There is this principle, therefore, even in the plant kingdom of this quest for direct contact with the source of vitality. The animal world, we have further development of motion and emotion. And we have many other interesting uh, phenomena. We also find that the various kingdoms are so constituted that the vital axis of the body attunes them to energies moving in various directions in space. The ancients recognize certain motions. They believe, for example, that plant vitality was a vertical motion from below, that man was a, an inverted plant with his root in heaven or in the sky, and that his energy descended in a vertical line, that the animal, having a horizontal or nearly horizontal spine, his energies or, in, or vitality were related to a cyclic motion around the earth, and that the chemical or physical vital energy of the basic material substance uh, had no direct motion of its own, but hung as a cloud or haze enveloping all physical things, a kind of haze such as we see in the early morning around the base of hills and things of that nature, something which is not uh, subject to motion as we know it, but hangs and clings, holding things together, <coughs> binding them into various structures. Thus, what we term the vital body of man is composed of these four kinds of energy, suitable for the distribution of various attributes and the, subs uh, the sustenance of the physical body as such. The ancients also likened uh, these streams of prana or energy uh, to the four elements, declaring that the physical ether represented the earth, the vital principle of ether represented water, the emotional principle of ether, fire, the mental principle of ether, air. And they therefore have in India many curious charts showing the human body divided horizontally into levels of stratas distributed among these elements, with a fifth element called akasha at the crown of the head, which represented a synthetic agent, a power which held the other ethers within itself, and called in alchemy azoth, or the mysterious agent of universal life. Now when we come to study the body which is composed of these etheric energies and elements, we find that it is basically composed, as we might assume or imagine, from what we term physical ether or chemical ether itself, which now plays the part of a subtle kind of matter, and becomes more or less the integrating principle of the etheric body. It is its bone, muscle, skin, tissue structure, comparatively invisible to us except under certain conditions. That this physical etheric vessel also becomes immediately the container of the superior etheric powers or principles. When seen together as one structure, the etheric body, as has been observed by Dr. Kilner in his work uh, using the Kilner screens, the etheric body corresponds in appearance generally to an energy field. It may be observed most acutely through certain of its lower parts, which have the appearance almost of an electrical field. The etheric body extends beyond the physical construction of man, a distance of from one and a half to five inches, and seems to surround the physical form with a luminous fur. 
This luminous fur consists of innumerable minute emanations which pass from the skin pores. And, of course, these emanations do not come from all parts of the body. Actually, they originate in the nerve terminals. And wherever a nerve ends, there from the end of it is extending a very minute ray of energy. This ray of energy is also responsible for certain reactions. For we know that under some conditions we can gain what might be apparently an almost miraculous ability to feel or to sense things a short distance from the body. Also, we may, under certain conditions, as in cases of mesmerism, find that these energy extensions uh, can be used to affect the energy fields of other persons. Under very careful analysis, we know that the vital body is composed essentially of molecules, and that this, these molecular forms, very minute, are in a mysterious way associated with the body's physical cells, and that there is an etheric molecule associated with each physical cell of the body. This is the reason why the old Hindus affirmed that the etheric double was an exact duplicate of the physical body, because it corresponds molecule for molecule with all structure. The etheric body itself, being thus a field of emanation, if we study the emanations very carefully and systematically, we observe that these, that these emanations are like some kind of falling water. Socrates, in describing or discussing the flowing of water, uh, told his disciples to remember that what we call the flowing of water is the result of minute dry bodies moving across and with each other, tumbling over each other, but that each original unit was dry. He had therefore essentially discovered something that we have not known until much later. In this emanation from the etheric body, or through the pores of the skin, we have therefore a perpetual emanation of what appears to be light, but which when carefully examined proves to be a stream of minute geometrical forms, almost like extremely tiny snowflakes. <coughs> These represent molecular discharges of energy. And what we call electricity is actually composed of a minute of minute bodies, which because of their size and their rapidity of motion give the impression of being a continuous line of energy. These emanations from the body, surrounding it in all parts, emanating from every part of the surface of the skin, will also be observed to be in different number, density, and vitality in various parts of the body. Hilner was also able to discover this with his dicyanine screens. We know, for example, that certain parts of the body are much more energy radiant than others, and that these energy radiation areas correspond with certain symbolic structure within the body itself. We know, for instance, that where hair is dense upon the body, the emanation fields are heaviest. And there is everything to cause us to suspect that what we call hair is very largely a growth or crystallization, a form of vegetation sustained by energy moving directly from the surface of the body, and therefore directing the general core of growth. The hair being a single tube-like structure which has been constructed around an energy field for a purpose. We also know that there are certain parts and extensions of the body, such as the hands, in which the amount of energy is greater than that in the larger body surfaces. We know also that each finger terminates in a particularly powerful vortex of etheric emanation. We know also that this emanation differs with the different fingers under various conditions. We know also that there are powerful centers in the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet, where in uh, the old Buddhist and other uh, mystical traditions uh, there were chakras painted, or symbols, wheels, or disks of energy. And these, into a measure, also correspond with the traditional wounds of Jesus, from which uh, the energy for the salvation of men is said to flow. Of all parts of the body, three are most abundant in their energy fields. Uh, the least of these, but still very abundant, is the great solar plexus, or the what might be termed the sympathetic brain of the body. The solar plexus 
has tremendous importance, particularly on the level of vitality, or the perpetuation of the functions which are active in man. The physical or chemical form of ether does not move function, but the vital ether, which is centered largely in the great abdominal area, moves action and bestows upon all things both their uh, will-led uh, or their autonomic functions. Uh, some functions are by conscious purpose, some like respiration and the beating of the heart are automatic. And all of these functions, which have to do with the principle of animation and motion, are under this second etheric power. It is so located in general in the great solar plexus area and is closely associated with digestion and assimilation in the physical body. We will come back to this in a moment because it is the particular subject of the evening, but we want to pass on to a, a general resume of certain other points. The next most important of all the centers is the cranial area, or the brain. And in the brain we have a tremendous exaggeration of etheric substance. Also an extraordinary differentiation and a breaking down of ether into sub-levels and sub-varieties and sub-vibratory notes, all within one grand octave, however. Because of the tremendous intensity of the etheric field around the brain, it is frequently represented as the nimbus or halo around the heads of sanctified persons. And of course we realize that the nimbus has been used in religious art by many peoples prior to Christianity, because wherever the individual or the mystic has had any extrasensory perception at all, he has become aware of the luminosity around the heads of persons in whom a, an extraordinary and remarkable degree of growth has been attained. The greatest of all, the most important of all these centers of vitality, however, and the one that must always and inevitably dominate, is the heart center. It is here that is located the Septapana cave of the Buddhist initiation, the seven-roomed house of man or the cave with the seven chambers within it. Or as Tatian said to Hermes in his famous discourse, upon the diaphragm stands the pyramid of the Almighty, which is the heart. The heart, therefore, is actually the center of the entire objective life power of the individual. And uh, it is from here that the most powerful and tenacious streams of energy are constantly moving. Also, the energy uh, has interior motions, which we do not see. For wherever there is an internal function, there is a field of luminous, en luminous energy in which it takes place. Because of the uh, beating of the heart, the drum of Shiva, there must be and is a most constant luminosity, a powerful luminosity, surrounding the entire heart area. An Arab physicist many centuries ago, attempting to analyze the source of life in man, performed various experiments upon animals, in one of which he exposed the heart in the living animal and touched the apex of the left ventricle with his finger. Immediately it raised a blister. It burned his hand. Because, as he expressed it, there is a fire there which is constantly burning. We do not know that it is hot because the heat is, dis is diffused throughout the body. But if it is isolated, it becomes a tremendously powerful center of heat and energy. So we have these centers from which energy may flow in particular and peculiar abundance. Also in cases of pregnancy, there is a tremendous energy activation around the uterus. And this can be seen extending sometimes a foot to 15 inches from the body. Because a new life is developing and all of nature's energies are blazing forth in the integration of this structure. And there is no time in the life of the human being and in which the energy fields are comparatively as powerful as before his birth. Because they are busily engaged in accomplishing a purpose uh, which has great and lasting significance. Now we study these energy fields and we observe that they differ markedly with various individuals. We also know that they correspond in certain respects to a communication system. For example, if you stub your toe, there is an immediate change in the energy field of the pineal gland in the brain. 
And the pineal gland shows the injury or shows the discomfiture of this incident. If the individual puts his hand in hot water, which is unpleasantly hot, there is immediately a change in the magnetic field of the heart, the brain, and the generative system. All these are responding in various ways because each one has a job to do to get that man's hand out of the hot water. One type of energy must give him the power to take it out. Another type of energy must give him the understanding to know he must take it out. Another type of energy must convey the pain impre impression so that he will recognize discomfiture and attempt to prevent its continuance. So that it is not sufficient that any one energy alone uh, be notified or any center in the body be notified. The entire structure on various levels must be notified because the correction of any immediate problem, uh, the understanding of any subject, the accomplishment of any work or activity means that vitality, emotion, and thought must all be equally alerted in, each, in order that each may take its proper part in the change which is projected, whatever that may be. In studying the adult, in the case of the magnetic fields, we come to a number of other important discoveries. We observe that these fields are very heavily influenced by emotion and thought and by the general condition of vitality. Obviously, the chemical or physical ether has no de absolute demand upon the individual. It is not sustained by nutrition or anything else. It is sustained because it is part of the Earth's magnetic field. Therefore, he participates in it because his physical body is part of the Earth, must be nourished and sustained with it, and must be kept in order in order that the total physical factors of, of existence may be maintained. Immediately, however, above this level of the uh, etheric uh, energy comes the second, which is the vital energy which is particularly associated with the vitality of the individual in its most rudimentary and primary form corresponding to the plant kingdom. This vitality must therefore be constantly replenished and there is no way in which it can be replenished except by one or more of the means which nature has provided. The first and most important of course uh, from the standpoint of universal availability is air. And air, whether we realize it or not, is a constant and eternal vehicle of prana, or energy. And air is simply a field of pranic emanation, which has passed into a certain level, which we call physical air. But still, it is a constant and abundant source, not only of vitality, but of many other things. We know, for instance, now what our ancestor did not know, and that is that if you place air under sufficient compression, you can reduce it to a solid. And also, that if you can examine that solid afterwards, you will find in it practically everything that you find anywhere else in nature. In other words, it is perfectly conceivable that we can mine gold from the air. It is also perfectly conceivable that we could get petroleum from the air. It would be in very minute amounts, yes probably hardly profitable, but every element that is, exists in nature exists also in the air, including a number of very heavy, precipitating materials which we know as smog, <laughs> perhaps are not absolutely essential to our survival. But air is a tremendous source of energy, and it is constantly washed in its natural way or natural manner by the sun. Now, recognizing air to be a carrier of ether, and recognizing it, therefore, as one of the life-giving agencies, we now discover another use of energy, and this brings up something which we might make a brief detour on. I hate to take the time, but I think it is important. And that, namely, that air is an invisible kind of water. It is an invisible kind because it is a degree more attenuated than water. But it has many of the attributes and qualities of water, in which, in fact, all ethers do. That is why etheric emanations can be most easily captured in frozen water, and we have the pictures on window panes. These pictures, incidentally, can be changed by the human will, if he knows, if man knows how to do it. <coughs> because he can influence the etheric patterns. But ether, like water, 
is used in one of its functions for the regeneration of exhausted or polluted energy. The energy passing, for example, into man through respiration passes at the process of inhalation and becomes a source of vitality. Wastes, dead materials, are passed out of the lungs through exhalation and are returned again to the air. We are subjected to light and to the pranic field. Uh, they are revitalized and pass through a kind of regeneration in which then the air is again suitable uh, to be used. The same thing happens in water. And water will inevitably purify a certain amount of refuse material which may be entrusted to it. But if water is pressed beyond its absorbing, transforming, regenerating power, it then becomes polluted. And if it is polluted, it simply means that the amount of material entrusted to it for purification is greater than it can transform. <coughs> Air has the same limitation. And it is very possible that one of the phases of our smog problem lies in the fact that our various activities are throwing into the atmosphere more material than the vital energies of the sun and the vital field of the earth can transform. Therefore, gradually, a pollutional factor is being built up. Now, as man is constantly emanating etheric streams from the body's surface, we know that these etheric streams form a kind of elimination. These were called in 18th century France, during the period of Dr. Mesmer's researches, an invisible perspiration, which again is a method of excretion, of sending out of the body certain materials which are not useful to it. If, therefore, the energy fields are depleted, the excretion through the etheric double is not complete, and we therefore begin to build up what we commonly know as toxins. Ether thus has this particular and important function, the function of purification. And the uh, polluted material returning into the stream of pranic energy is reconverted and made again useful uh, to the conscious needs of creatures. Also, there are creatures in nature uh, which are able to contribute to this purification. For some forms of life live on energies which are destructive to other forms. And thus nature maintains a magnificent equilibrium in its process of preserving and purifying the streams of life that are needed for human survival. If we study the difference, for instance, between a healthy person and a sick person, we will observe immediately that this difference is marked in the, in the vital emanations of the etheric body. The moment vitality for one reason or another is impeded or is obstructed within the body, we find this energy uh, gradually fading out. The fur seems to fall limp against the surface of the body. The emanation retires until it merely encircles the body by an eighth or a quarter of an inch. Its color is faint, and even in the most vital parts of the body, there is a marked depletion. Although this depletion cannot be complete, or the body would die. We observe then that it is quite possible to diagnose a variety of ailments through the study of this etheric field. And gradually, through various types of electrical research and so on, we are discovering methods by means of which these emanations can be qualitatively and quantitatively measured. And through this measurement, we are able to understand them and prepare various remedies. Nutrition is another very important phase of our problem. Nutrition, however, is not the support of the body by means of the dead bodies of other things. We do not live upon forms. We live, rather, upon their energy fields. And we are nourished by anything that we eat merely because of its vital or etheric content. This etheric content restores or strengthens the etheric structure of the body of the individual. Thus, by the food, we live not upon the form of the food, but upon its vitality principle. This was known in India, Egypt, and China long before the discovery of the so-called vitamin theory. 
but it is the vitality or the life principle of energy in things. Not the divine life principle, but the energy life principle, by means of which uh, nutrition is possible. It is the gradual absorption of other energy into the body. Now, we know that the energies of other structures cannot be immediately incorporated into the human body. They must be introduced in small amounts, and they must gradually be overwhelmed by the energy field of the body itself. This is the reason why, under exhaustion, or under pressure, or under extreme uh, nervousness, food does not digest. It means that the energies necessary to overwhelm or overcome the foreign etheric energy uh, are not abundant. Gradually, however, in the process of etheric chemistry, the etheric body of the larger living being takes over the isolated etheric fragments of food, uh, changes their vibratory rate to correspond to its own, and then is able to assimilate them into its energy field. This process is constantly going on in one way or another. Now we know that wherever there is life, there is action. And we have two kinds of activity now that, is asso that are associated directly with man's physical survival. One is the cohesive bodily energy, by means of which forms are held together, and the other is vitality, by means of which function is maintained. Now these two uh, represent a compound which can never be separated from man during the state of life. If man is ever separated from these two forms of energy, he will die. Therefore, it is not possible during the state of life for these energies to fail or falter, or the structures which support them to pass beyond a certain degree of desuetude without endangering total survival. <coughs> now these are the two lower fields forming the lower half of the etheric structure. And above these are two other forms of ether. And the particular quality of these other two forms is that they are not merely radiant. Both of these other forms are empowered with motion. The two higher etheric structures are both movable. They both exist in a state of constant motion, not merely polar vibration. The lowest of these two higher etheric principles is the one which binds the emotional nature of the person to the emotional center of the body. And in simple fact, this emotional center is located in the apex or in the great part of the liver. Therefore, the principle of emotion in man is distributed through the liver. Now this does not mean that man's loves and hopes and fears originate in his liver. Let's, uh, let's not understand it that way. Remember, however, that between love and hate and fear and this physical body, there is an interval. The body does not hate. Hate has no body. <clears throat> the body does not love. And love as the ancient Greeks said, is invisible forever. Therefore, the process of bringing emotions through into objectivity means that a method has to exist by which an abstract energy, in this case a psychic energy, the power of the soul, can come into the material form and be distributed through the nervous structure and also through uh, the endocrine chain. To accomplish this end, therefore, a pole has to be established in the body, very much like the receiving set of a radio or television, which unless it is appropriately attuned will not be able uh, to reproduce uh, the message or the play or whatever is being broadcasted. Therefore, the liver forms this radio receiving set for emotional energy and causes the individual to experience in life the sense of feeling. To achieve this sense of feeling, the emotional energy 
which is associated with the liver, must distribute this emotional content which it carries within it, and for which it forms a vehicle or body throughout the system. And according to the old Hindu philosophy, this is done by way of the blood. Therefore, as Mephisto says in Faust, blood is a most peculiar essence. For blood is the symbol in ancient times of the soul. It is the symbol also of man's emotional content. On the level of religion, we know the mystery of the cleansing blood. On all symbol, symbol levels, we realize the same thing. We know that the spear of Longinus the centurion pierced the liver of Christ. We know also that Prometheus, the ancient Greek light bearer, chained to the rocky crag of Mount Caucasus, was given a vulture to gnaw forever at his liver. The liver, therefore, from earliest times, has been associated with the distribution of emotional energy and is the particular seat and center from which this energy is distributed and diffused throughout the sensitive areas of man's sympathetic nervous system and through the chakras or the nerve centers of the body. Now, as this occurs in connection with the emotional ether, we know that this ether carries with it a number of important functions, one of which is to maintain sensory perception. We know that also it sustains the cycle of the skandhas, or these uh, interrelated attributes by means of which the individual becomes conscious of himself as a being. These are the intensities. These are the attributes, the roots of selfishness and selflessness, of passion and compassion. <coughs> and by means of these, uh, the physical body is able to interpret the emotional degree of maturity attained by the entity or the person in the body. This further uh, gives us understanding why it is that emotional content will affect physical health. We know that when emotional intensity strikes the etheric field of which must distribute this intensity, uh, that certain results are inevitable. This field may and should exist, much like a pleasant afternoon in spring. It should be placid. The energy itself should be moving graciously and gracefully in the cycles which are natural to it. But about this time, the individual, as a person, becomes angry. Immediately, a storm breaks in the etheric field. This storm can be accompanied by all the traditional thunder and lightning that is involved in a tempest. Not in a teapot, in this case, but in the lobe of the liver. Following an unusual display, therefore, of temperament, uh, there is an inevitable exhaustion in the energy field. The energy field reacts by a powerful opposition, and that which uh, was previously superabundant uh, suddenly appears as privated. The uh, emotional energies have been wasted, have been lost and willfully expended, resulting in emotional depletion and very, very often accompanying the fatigue and, of course, a very definite effect upon uh, the heart and the heartbeat. Uh, the polygraph or lie detector has shown us, for example, that every motion of the individual results in irregularities or changes in the heartbeat. Thus, the individual who is, whose emotional intensities as a person are forced, uh, these emotional tens uh, tensions or uh, abnormalities are forced into the physical structure, into manifestation where they will result in the shouting, the screaming, the stamping of the feet, the angry looks, and all the other physical phenomena, that this transmission of emotion into physical symbolism is accompanied along a road of ether, and that these emotional intensities have a tendency to destroy or at least to, dis to limit or restrict the normal functions of this etheric binder. And without this binder, the individual is without emotional or color content. 
and therefore it is very important to him that he maintain this function in as orderly a manner as possible. The next and highest of the four egos which go together to make the compound which we call man is the mental ego. This is the bridge which links the individual as a person with the brain structure. The brain is therefore an extension of the mind. And the development of the brain is only possible because of the integrated power of the mind behind it. But brain is a material thing, mind is a supermaterial thing. And these, like the East and West, are the twain that cannot meet. The only way they can be brought together is through this bridge of ether, which participates of the qualities of both in a middle ground. Consequently, all thought moving into expression must move across this etheric bridge, and becoming uh, thereby transmitted uh, to the conscious centers within the brain, or the consciousness centers within the brain, may will then be distributed as an experience, as an awareness, or as a realization, a thought, or an idea. Now all these thoughts and ideas not only have to come from the mind into the brain, but the moment this transference takes place, the brain is placed at a disadvantage. We must realize that we use the brain to think with, but the brain is not equipped for a continuity of thought processes. Uh, it requires eight or ten times as much energy to think as it does to feel. And it requires many times as much energy, energy to feel as to act. Physical action, though the most strenuous, requires the least amount of energy. The reason being that it requires a grosser form of energy. Action can be maintained by a crude oil level of energy, but thought only by the finest ethyl product. Therefore, the process of refining energy makes it more valuable, makes it more difficult to secure, and makes it a more serious thing to waste. Mental energy, therefore, is much more subtle, and a great deal more energy as prana, or life force, uh, must be distilled to secure that which is necessary for thought process. Thought process also very quickly fatigues its own channels, and in a comparatively short time, the brain, under too much thought activity, begins to show acute fatigue symptoms. Thus, uh, we know that constant activity is not possible to the physical body, because it is not constituted to uh, carry such a load. It must, therefore, have appropriate periods of rest. Now, in appropriate periods of rest, we have what we call the sleep habit. Now, there have been a great many discussions, in fact, we have talked about what is sleep. Actually, sleep, of course, represents a rise of toxin due to fatigue. It means that the individual has exhausted the available energies of a certain field of life activity. Therefore, he has also torn down a certain amount of structure. Just as an electric light bulb, every time we turn it on, takes a certain amount of wear, and every so many hundred hours, we know that light bulb will be finished. We have to get a new one. Now, man, unfortunately, cannot so conveniently get a new body. Therefore, it is the same thing as with the light bulb or the radio tube. We try to lengthen its life by only using it at periodic intervals. We give it as much possibility of rest as we can, realizing that by so doing, we expand and we extend the total span of its facility. We probably don't actually extend the life of the bulb, but we do uh, use it only when we need it. Therefore, it does not require replacement as often. Sleep, then, must be a period in which stress or strain, which is always the result of two qualities that are not completely harmonious working in a compound or in an interaction. Compounds are the basis of friction. Friction causes wear and tear, and wear and tear ultimately depletes structure. Wherever two modes of energy work together, there is wear and tear. Therefore, whenever a thought arises in the brain, there is wear and tear to the brain. Not essentially to the thought, because it is above matter, and matter is where wear and tear lies. 
It means then that in order to permit reconstruction carried on by the physical ether and the vital or fluidic ether to restore damage, to rebuild, reactivate, revitalize cellular life, to impart new molecular energy to cellular structure, that there has to be a period in which activity ceases, and recuperation or reconstruction is the primary purpose. Now we know, for example, that the emotional and mental ethers, or those energies which sustain feeling and thought, are eternally restless. And in Indian philosophy we are told that there can be no recuperation on the mental and emotional level unless these ethers temporarily break contact with physical structure. In other words, as they would put it, these ethers simply cease active function. They become dormant, or almost completely so, retaining only a sufficient bond with the body to preserve the life a continuity of faculty and, and feeling. Thus it was said in ancient times that in sleep these ethers simply departed. They left. And therefore the individual was without emotional or mental energization. The departure comes with the process of going to sleep. And when these energies are re-established, the individual awakes. This means, however, that the etheric structure must be divided into two parts, one of which is capable of being separated from function without danger, the other cannot be. That part of the etheric structure which vitalizes a, a function, a maintained structure, cannot be separated from the body. Therefore, the two higher etheric instruments are said to be separable. That is, they can depart or return. The rest our lower ethers, however, must remain constant during life. These four ethers, then, constitute the four bridges, and they form together what we term the vital body. They are bridges upon which traffic moves in several directions. This traffic may move either from the person to the body, or from the body to the person. One is action, and the other is reaction. Now the ethers moving from the person to the body carry with them the energized activities of the person. Those returning from the body to the individual or to the individuality behind it carry also certain messages. These messages being primarily uh, the results of sensory orientation in the material world. Thus we know that one of the functions of ether is to convey the sensory findings of the individual to the centers in which these findings can be evaluated. And that sight carries its message into the brain. And that here the brain orients it, thinks about it, meditates upon it, accepts or rejects according to its own pleasure. This is not true. All sight uh, function, or all other sensory function, is first of all an agitation, a conditioned agitation within the etheric field. The ethers carry the impressions directly across their bridge to the corresponding part of man himself, not the body. Therefore, certain emotional messages are carried to the emotional parts of the person in the body, and mental messages to the mental part. It is this person that then passes the energy equivalents back again through the brain or through the liver uh, to become objectively known in the material personality. This process is exceedingly rapid. It is so rapid that the average individual could not even measure it or estimate it. As far as we are concerned, the process is instantaneous. 
But actually, it is instantaneous because this entire mystery is suspended in a sea of constant vibration. And this vibration is ever flowing out against the two shores, the person above and the body below. And this vibration, therefore, carries its message constantly to both of its extreme polarities. And these polarities participate in activities of all kinds because of this energy field. Now let us suppose for a moment, in thinking of this, that we now have the compound vital body with its four essential functions. That this vital body, according to Hindu philosophy, after death, takes on, after death of the physical body, takes on the appearance and general attributes of the previous physical embodiment. That it remains for a time usually not too great a length of time, until all of these energy records are transformed or returned to the person. After that, the vital body itself disintegrates. The vital body having no essential meaning other than that of a conveyor or a messenger. It is not the source of any creativity of its own. It is simply a, a carrier, a wire-like uh, medium through which energy moves, or upon which energy is transmitted. This vehicle of transmission, however, must precede and survive a time, uh, the physical body uh, with which it is associated, because it is responsible in very large measure for the building up of this body, and it is also responsible for the sensitivity of the body to the impulses and will of the person who inhabits it. Thus the vital body is very closely and inevitably associated with health. And I think we can begin to understand why it is associated with health when we realize that it is compelled, regardless of inclination, which it does not have, to faithfully convey whatever be the mood, whatever be the conviction or the attitude of the person. It is inevitably and instantly conveyed to the body and distributed through centers appropriate to such purposes. It naturally follows that a complete mental or emotional intemperance on the part of the person will ultimately work a serious and desperate hardship upon the body, which must constantly respond as best it can and according to the faculties that it possesses to the insistent demands of the person. Thus the person is a tyrant over its own body, unless it has learned and come to understand its debt, its responsibility, and the value of this body, which is its link with objectivity. Without this body and its etheric methods of communication, there could be no objective link between the person and the material universe. Thus the vital body is the channel by which man conquers the world. And it is also the vehicle or means by which man perfects his awareness of the world. It is by means of this body that man imposes his will upon physical matter or physical body. And it is also by means of this that the needs, requirements, and desperate circumstances of the physical body are brought to the attention of the person. We find this, for example, in the case of danger, where the danger to the physical body being real and apparent, there is an instinctive reflex of protection. The, the, the person takes over and attempts to save his body. Conversely, there are times in which the body, apparently, has to come to the aid of the person, and it may do so by temporarily blocking a function in order to prevent a dangerous abuse or misuse of power. The body can become, therefore, the prison of the individual who misuses it as a house. And wherever we have an abuse of function or an abuse of power, we have elements of retribution creeping in. Not because the body consciously wishes to punish. It has no such awareness but because nature inevitably punishes abuse, and the body is the victim 
And because of its structure, it can only take a certain degree of misuse. Then it becomes incapable of continued normal function. This is the punishment. That the body which has been exploited can no longer be depended upon uh, to function normally. Realizing that these links, therefore, bind the person to the body, we begin to understand something about disease that we didn't perhaps think of before. Namely, that disease is actually the physical symptomology or symbolism of vibratory ex excess within the person. <coughs> disease is nearly always the direct result of emotional or mental pressures. We are beginning to sense this on a psychological level, but we do not know why. What we have to learn is that the vibratory rates which are negative and which are rising with intensity in the person, particularly in his mental and emotional life, that these are inevitably transferred by the ethers to the body. And these excesses pollute the body or demand of it some strange and unnatural activity. And this in turn destroys the harmony of relationships between the person and the body. It naturally also follows, therefore, that the person in the body does not suffer from the diseases of the body. Therefore, essentially, an individual who for some reason is mentally ill, is mentally ill only in the terms of being brain ill, so far as physical diagnosis is concerned. In other words, the mental and emotional natures are not capable or susceptible to insanity as we know it. But, very often, uh, the physical sickness of the mind is due to psychic patterns, complexes, frustrations, and neuroses, which are the psychic equivalents of ailments. These existing within the person must inevitably stamp themselves upon the body, either becoming again the channel for this inevitable interchange. Now, as we go further with this particular phase of our subject, we begin to come on another, a number of other interesting points. The total etheric field of which we are so primarily concerned has its own direct role uh, through which it enters into the bodily economy. And this road is the spleen. Therefore, the spleen actually acts almost like the elaborate antenna of a radio or television set, or as one of these uh, magnificent instruments used to detect the approach of strange aircraft. It picks up and carries into the uh, physical structure of the spleen the records or impressions of the entire etheric field. Therefore, it is said that the linga serara in Hindu philosophy lies coiled in the liver. And here we may say uh, that it becomes the absolute administrator of energy. There are certain ailments which affect, uh, pardon me, in the coil in the spleen. This uh, spleen, therefore, is associated with energy depletions. And certain serious ailments of the spleen may gradually result in forcing the vital body out of adequate function. This, in turn, will result gradually in the loss of energy content. The spleen being of this umbrella-like organ, which picks up the total etheric vibration for distribution, must then immediately channel it to the principal centers other than itself, these centers being primarily the brain, the heart, and the liver. The central area of the spleen itself, with its magnetic field, extends into the abdominal area and impinges upon the great semilunar ganglia, uh, which are the peculiar instruments of the sympathetic nervous system. The spleen, therefore, does have great meaning. And uh, we know that we have a term of, uh, relating to spleen as relating to anger, or to discontent, or to excitement, or agitation. 
In ancient times, magicians believed that evil entities entered the body through the spleen. They therefore took all possible precautions to protect this part of the body by their formulas and by their talismans and by their various magical equipments and devices. Now here we have an interesting problem. We have man with a body derived from the elements, a physical body, with a superphysical being derived from the higher levels or planes of nature, and a connecting link derived from the etheric vehicle of nature itself. In other words, man's physical body is bound to the physical body of the world, is etheric to the etheric body of the world, is emotional to the emotional body, and is mental to the mental body of the world. Therefore, man possesses, first of all, mind, which is in turn the result of a binder between the mental nature and a superior world. And he has a brain, which is the result of a binder between the mental nature and an inferior world. Thus, mind stands in man as supported by the universal principle of intellect. And brain stands supported by the personal principle of mind. <coughs> Thus, in every part of the universe, there is an absolute order and a descent from universals to particulars. And in this descent, man's physical body is the basket which catches all the particulars, and by which these particulars are manifested forth on various levels of activity. In the Eastern system, therefore, uh, the control and direction of prana, or the vital energy of the body, became extremely important. And now we must go into certain other attributes of ether. Just as the average person does not recognize any need for a vehicle other than the physical, and looking in the mirror sees his face and calls it himself, so essentially the etheric body, if accepted, becomes a substitute for everything superior to itself. If one of these days science discovers for certain, and without further reservations, the reality of a vital principle behind man, called the etheric double, science will then announce that it has discovered all. It will decide that mind, emotion, and action, everything, originate in this etheric field. Just as today, science is inclined to think that thought is a result of a certain reactive, psychoelectrical, biochemical process within the brain. Once the etheric field is fully understood, it will be blamed for everything, held responsible for everything, and be regarded as the true explanation to everything. The old Hindu teachers were well aware of this also. And they realized that in their disciplines with their disciples, that the disciple who became aware of ether and became aware of the existence of his own vital body was not certain for a moment whether or not he had come face to face with God. Because the vital body, uh, being an instrument of vibration, taking upon itself the coloration of the person behind it, and therefore being the immediate revealer of thought and emotion and vitality, seem to be the very source of these things. Also recognizing another important factor, and that is the power of thought upon the ether. We come upon a series of very interesting interrelated circumstances. Mind is superior to ether, obviously, because that which is superior uses the inferior for a channel. And the channel cannot be greater than the thing which it channels, or else the position of the two would be reversed. Consequently, the human thought process has a great deal more influence on the etheric substances than upon material substances. This is perhaps one of the reasons why mental healing, thought healing, faith healing, have been recognized since the very earliest time. It has been demonstrated that these etheric patterns can be and are affected by the conscious thought and will of the individual. This is particularly and dramatically true of emotional ether. 
and to the individual who is experimenting with this substance, uh, the, emotion, the emotional energy and its etheric character, uh, carrier can be identified or considered to be one. We are not yet well enough advanced in this form of abstract metaphysics to be with certainty able to differentiate them. Thus, what do we have? We have the possibility of almost anything happening within the etheric structure. Because this structure can take on, temporarily, a variety of fantasies induced by imagination or belief. One of the most common problems we find in connection with Oriental philosophies dealing with this subject is the substitution of ether for what may be termed the higher bodies of the person. The etheric bodies of thought and emotion are therefore regarded, to, uh, regarded as thought and emotion, when in reality they are merely subtle carriers of it. Here is an example of what we mean. The etheric double is the archetype of the body. Therefore, it is the direct mold into which the body is cast. Every organ and structure has its etheric duplicate. Therefore, there must be an etheric heart, which corresponds to the physical heart, an etheric liver, an etheric lungs, an etheric blood circulation. These things, on a molecular level, correspond exactly. The superior principles of man, however, are not essentially molecular. They are what we would term today atomic. And the old Hindus, in their Indian atomistic schools, back a thousand, fifteen hundred years ago, were already playing with the atomic theory, as were the Greeks. And they realized that the various bodies of man are all composed of substances and that these substances have natures and identities of their own, and that there is no vehicle that is not substantial of some kind. That alone is unbodied or insubstantial, which is infinite life itself. Everything else must have vehicles, and these vehicles are containers created for the distribution of a universal energy. So in man, for example, we have a physical nervous system, and an etheric nervous system. Under normal conditions, the etheric structure gives no trouble unless the physical structure is brought into an inharmonious relationship with it. Simple example. Supposing uh, you place an orange or a hard golf ball under your arm, press down upon it until you stop circulation. If you do so, the arm will go to sleep. It goes to sleep because the etheric current is cut off. And therefore, the etheric body has a complete subsistence apart from the material. And the destruction or loss of the etheric, of the physical member will not disrupt or destroy its etheric double. Uh, Lord Nelson told a story relating to that, in which he said that after he had lost his arm, he frequently felt it and that there was nothing else that convinced him so completely that man had a superphysical constitution as the fact that the arm that wasn't there could hurt. The etheric double, therefore, is also an arm, and if the physical arm is destroyed, the etheric double continues to exist, even if the method of its destruction of the physical arm is by a sharp instrument. This will scar or injure the etheric double, but not destroy it but could be responsible, in the case of Nelson, for the pain which continued to be felt etherically. On this basis of thinking, and the ancients were pretty well agreed on it, we therefore realize that man can have etheric stomach trouble and physical stomach trouble. And that technically, therefore, unless the stomach difficulty is due to poison or to the introduction of some dangerous substance into the body, uh, that the stomach trouble is most likely to be first etheric and then physical. The etheric stomach trouble being generally described as butterflies or nervousness or something which injures the normal function of the stomach. 
Thus, derangements due to psychic stress from the emotions and thoughts first affect the etheric organs, and then from the etheric organs are passed into the material. If the material organs are injured, the etheric may continue to function. Then function physically is not possible because of the injury to the material form, not to the depletion or loss of the etheric double. In this way, we are also susceptible, however, to a series of rather interesting conditions. Consider for a moment the etheric equivalent to the human cerebrospinal nervous system. This tremendous network of nerves arising from this bulb-like root in the brain and extending like the la branches, twigs, and leaves of an immense tree throughout the body, which is almost indeed the tree of life. This tree, with its innumerable branches and its innumerable filaments, becomes a vast, radiant energy field in which the tree form is more perceptible than it is with the physical nervous system. Here we could discover it by dissection if we were able uh, to dissect the tiny filaments. But when they are radiant with internal life, we can see them when they're much too small to see uh, in the physical structure. If then, we assume for a moment that this is the case, we then discover that in the etheric structure, we have what the Hindu in his Eastern philosophy calls the, the etheric double of the Kundali Shakti, or the great mystery of the chakras, or the entire set of nerve ganglia, extending from the base of the brain upward uh, to the thousand petal lotus at the crown of the head. This system of chakras is tremendously involved in yoga. But needless to say, the true chakras and their energies are not etheric. The true set of chakras uh, passes through the entire septenary constitution of man. But they do have their equivalents totally within the etheric body. The majority of cases in which efforts to develop the Kundali Shakti by those who are not under adequate discipline does not have a thing to do with this mysterious serpent power. Because whether we like to realize it or not, we should know that this power is not under the control of foolish, stupid, ignorant human beings. No individual with three lessons and a poor teacher is going to loosen the entire mystery of universal energy upon himself. He couldn't do it. Nature has many too many breaks upon this power, preventing it from the possibility of being so tremendously abused. But the individual can cause a symbolic representation of this process in the etheric double. And he can have all kinds of symptoms. Symptoms that are not real. Symptoms that simply arise from the disturbances caused in his energy fields uh, by unwise and injudicious actions. If we add to this his own imagination, he can get himself into a pretty serious dilemma. But it does not mean that actually he has been able to pass through uh, these mysterious gates that protect him. Because actually, the original and basic power of the second chakra from the bottom locks the every part of the field above the etheric. Therefore, the individual cannot possibly accidentally get into it. But he can have all the symptoms. He can have all the apparent experiences. And if should he have a slight amount of etheric perception, he may even think he can see it. But what is actually being disturbed is the etheric field. And because this field could appear to him to be a tremendous mystery, he seldom asks more, and is content to assume that things are as they seem to be, which is a dangerous assumption in the invisible universe, just as it is in the visible universe. Things are not always what they seem to be. Now, going further into this problem of ether, we discover, for example, that the etheric structure carries what Bemi, the mystic, calls the signatura rerum, or the true seal of the king. This is the impression of its own etheric pattern 
infinitely repeated in structure. Leonardo realized that growth in nature is an infinite repetition of an identical theme. That this theme is variously specialized, differing in various parts of its appearance, but one master formula underlies the whole thing. Therefore, in man, the etheric energies and etheric principles are constantly stamping themselves upon parts as symbolic of the whole. Thus, if we possess the knowledge, possess the understanding, we can capture the total picture from any of its parts. Experimentation recently has shown, for example, uh, that the individual can convey the total psychology or integration of himself through his own etheric field into any substance that he touches or contacts or comes near to. If a person moves through a room, his etheric record remains there for a time because the vibration causes the natural energies in the room to harmonize with this new vibration for a short time as it passes through. Gradually, this pattern will die out, but it can be conceivable that it could be captured within a given length of time. An individual breathing into a glass of water will leave an image of his psychic field there. An individual who wears any garments of a, of, or clothing for any length of time will also impregnate them with this etheric pattern, which is essentially a rate of vibration. It is also quite certain that every drop of blood in the human body will crystallize according to the total etheric picture of the individual. And therefore, theoretically, can be used for the diagnosis of disease. In fact, it has been used at various times. The study of the etheric body of man leads us inevitably to consider the etheric body of the earth, with which the functions and faculties of man are so closely related. We know that the earth's magnetic field, like that of the human being, is a medium or a carrier by means of which the solar energy can be accepted by a planet and can be transformed and distributed through that planet in various ways suitable to the maintenance of life. Thus a planet has a heart, a brain, a liver, lungs, everything that any body needs for function. But because the total purpose of a planet is different, the structure and use of these faculties, functions, and organs will naturally be different. We cannot see them, we will never discover them per se. But we know that just as man distributes energy through these certain distinct instruments, so the planet also has them. And that the earth also has zones or areas in which the etheric emanations are particularly powerful. We know, for example, that as the vital body has certain areas particularly its poles, in which there is tremendous electrical activity. The same is true of the Earth, where the electrical polarities are represented to us or recognized by us through the aurora borealis and the aurora australis. That the Earth is also an etheric instrument, and that through this etheric instrument, life is supported on the Earth. For man is on the earth because within the earth itself, or in its atmosphere, or in its own invisible body zones, the four ethers are operating perpetually. And these ethers, therefore, constitute always the links between body and being. And as they serve the earth as its link with the sun, so they serve man in his link with the self or the being which is the center of his mysterious solar system, or the system of his soul. We also know that in different areas, um, in various parts of the earth, these magnetic zones are of various strengths. We know that physical ether, for example, is associated uh, with the earth as a crystal, and is responsible for certain inevitable lines of fission within the earth which in the case of the total compound earth we call false. We know also that the discharge of energy from the um, heaviside layer of the earth's atmosphere may cause these uh, faults to move, resulting in earthquakes. 
We know also the discharges of etheric energy within man can produce parallel incidents or circumstances. The study of man, therefore, gives us a clue to the study of nature, and vice versa. For whatever happens in nature is in some way happening in man. Man is also bound by the ethers to a number of other important things. Uh, Paracelsus von Hohenheim told us that man is uh, man derives his spiritual energy from the stars, his intellectual energy energy from the planets, and his physical energy from the earth or the elements. Therefore, all of these are bridged to him by means of his etheric field. It is because of his etheric field, as Paracelsus pointed out, that there is a universe in man, that there are solar systems within him, that he is a solar system, because he is bound by this tremendous archetypal pattern. And this archetypal pattern, uh, which is causal in, a, in principle, first molds ether, and then ether molds body. So between all archetypes and their fulfillment must be ether. Now let's take that on another level of activity. A man decides to draw a picture. In his mind he has a picture in contemplation. On an easel before him stands a canvas and on a stand the necessary paint and brushes. Therefore here is the man, here are the elements and the materials, but as yet no picture. Now, how is this idea to be transformed into a picture? The idea, like the invisible causal nature of man, can be perfect in itself as far as complete or integrated is concerned. The artist may know exactly what he intends to paint. The materials are entirely adequate. And yet, without a bridge between the two, what happens? Nothing. Now, in the case of the artist, what is the bridge? Of course, the most immediate and natural answer is his hand. He's going to pick up the brushes, squeeze some paint on the palette, and go to work. But acti actually, activity is the link. Because without energy, he couldn't move his hand. Without vitality, he could not pick up the paint. Without the emotional ether, he would be unable to integrate the meaning of his picture. Without the vital ether, he could not distinguish the color of the pigments. And without the mental ether, he could not hold the design in consciousness. Therefore, all these ethers have to take part in the preparation of the transference of the picture from the mind to the canvas. This is constantly occurring with every activity of man. But act Actually, the simplest statement is that without energy, the picture cannot be painted. So between every abstraction and its concrete fulfillment is a demand upon energy. Man likes to assume that energy is infinite. And probably, in a large sense of the word, energy is infinite. Why then cannot man continually call upon it. What is the relation, for example, between the etheric body and age? Why is it that these energies cannot perpetually sustain beings like the fuel in the ever-burning lamp of the alchemist or, or Frida's wonderful wheel of perpetual motion? The answer, of course, goes back to a very simple thing. Action ultimately breaks down substance. The constant action of the body wears it out. Now we know that to a degree this activity can be slowed down. We know, for example, that considering the infancy and childhood of man, that man should live much longer than he does. Incidentally, physical ether has complete control of his life up to the seventh year. From the seventh to the fourteenth, vital ether. From the fourteenth to the twenty-first, emotional ether. And from the twenty-first to the twenty-eighth, mental ether. From the twenty-eighth to the thirty-fifth, physical ether takes over again. And the cycle is repeated. 
<coughs> until the end of life is reached. These ethers, therefore, have a certain particular and important part to play. But why does not man continue to exist if he has a cosmic fuel tank behind him that can never be empty? You may as well say, why doesn't an automobile run forever as long as standard oil continues to have petrol? It is not the fuel which is the key to survival. The key to survival is the overcoming of conflict in the relationship of the being and his body. The fuel is only the means of communication and the transportation of concepts. The fuel makes activity possible, but is not responsible for the quality of that activity. It, it must convey the message, whether it wants to or not, or whether the message is right or wrong. Now it happens that the physical body of man is a compound held together by a physical ether. It is the nature of compounds that they shall be dissolved. And from the moment of birth, man's compound is subjected to a strain which will ultimately bring about its dissolution. This strain is actu activated and increased by the unreasonable relationships between the person and his body. Ether supplies energy as long as body is capable of assimilating it. Or unless body, that's in body, the centers necessary for the distribution of this energy are undermined or destroyed. In almost every instance, a study indicates that these centers are prematurely destroyed by the intemperance of the individual. He does not take proper care of his body. He does not make proper use of his, of his energy factors. He dedicates the body to the fulfillment of the purpose of the will. Therefore, he is throughout life forever sacrificing body to intent, and to a large measure, to intensity. That which is most frequently used or driven at an unreasonable speed will be the first to break down. A car that is driven unreasonably will need repair sooner than another car. In fact, it can be hopelessly destroyed as a valuable possession by reckless driving. It is the same with the driver behind man. The, this driver can so afflict the body that by degrees, the ability of the physical centers set up for the purpose to transmit energy, this ability is undermined. These centers no longer respond to the vibration of the vital ether. They harden. They become less subtle until finally they no longer pick up the energy. The energy then continues to flow. These structures are bathed in it. But they do not respond. Devitalization does not mean that eternal life is deprived. It means that by degrees the individual destroys the power of his own structure to accept and distribute energy. To prevent this, Philosophy, particularly Eastern philosophy, has advocated the kind of life that reduces wear and tear to a minimum. It cautions against intemperance and excess of all kinds. It points out that tranquility, relaxation, the quiet, normal acceptance of life, uh, the quiet purposeful, organized administration of living, that these, by their natural conserving uh, factors, will normally lengthen life expectancy and decrease the expectancy of inefficiency. Whenever crystallization reaches a certain point, it will not respond to energy at all. It is simply like 
a radio set in which there is some dear serious defect so that it does not pick up the program. But as the program fades out with the collapsing tube, it has no evidence in this that the program in the station has faded out or that there is any break in the continuity of the broadcasting process. Devitalization is therefore man gradually separating himself from his energy fields. Separating himself because of his failure to maintain the bodily structure in a way in which it can pick up or respond to energy. Paracelsus worked on this theory also. And he also worked on the idea that by means of talismanic articles, it was possible to attract energy to the body. The Paracelsian theory, for example, of metallic medicines was based upon the ancient cosmological concept of the association of the planets with the metals. Therefore, gold was, a, was an energy-invoking power. Silver was a powerful agent for the stimulation of what may be termed emotional energy, or the gathering of it. I am for a certain kind of structural energy. Thus, material of this kind, when introduced into the body, would call magnetic polarities from space. These metals would set up magnets. And he went on to explain that what we call a pole in the body to receive ether is actually a kind of magnet which draws and accepts and discriminates between etheric energies. It holds those energies which it needs and the others are permitted to continue. And those energies which are not at all useful to man may be captured and held by a plant or an animal. Still others may be captured and held by beings and creatures that we have never thought about until the rise of science fiction. But in any event, these energies are picked up by the magnetic fields. If these fields are depleted, we have loss of the power to capture and hold energy. Well, what might, for instance, deplete the supply of gold in the human system? We know man has all of the elements in him, in very minute amounts, and that these are important in calling energies to him. The rapid and unreasonable exhaustion of the gold content through the reckless extravagance of the use of the energy which it represents may result in debility. If this debility is permitted to go on, it may exhaust the magnetic core of gold within the body and make it impossible for the body to call upon space and the atmosphere and life to replenish its gold supply. Thus these polarities, if exhausted, deprive man of the future availability of the substance unless it is introduced by some artificial or magnetic means. Also, the exhaustion of any element within the body and the destruction thereby of a magnetic field has something to do with the excretion of the body. For these magnetic fields are also responsible for taking to themselves and literally transmuting waste materials. Therefore, if they are depleted, they cannot cleanse uh, the zones and areas with which their energies are associated. Thus we have the rise of poison and the rise of toxin. Because we have depleted a part of an elaborate system of, of interrelationships by which man is constantly being fed by space and is casting back into space the waste materials which he can no longer use. Whenever a bodily structure or function Necessary to this process is impaired. A part of death sets in. And a great deal of our so-called most serious disease, type of disease, is local death. It is death which is going to spread from one small area of tissue until finally it corrupts perhaps the entire body or destroys the function of a complete organ. 
This death is always due to one thing, the cutting off of ether. For while the etheric energy is there, life is there. And where this etheric energy can make its entrances and its exits, it will constantly preserve the economy of parts. So that this whole energy, with all of its phases, is nutritional. Nursing, feeding, nourishing, emotion and thought. This energy also is constantly symbolizing its needs in various ways. Producing what we call symptoms. And symptoms relate not only to organs or parts of the body, but to qualities or conditions within the compound constitution. Years ago, we always treated the sick where the pain was. Today, we no longer do so, because we realize that the pain may be at one end of the body and the cause at the other. We know now that symptoms spread, and we know that the whole body becomes a symbolic field for diagnosis. For this reason, when Paracelsus discovered, for example, that the spleen, the great gateway of etheric energy, was being impaired, he placed a gold ring on the little finger of the left hand, because he realized that that was what was called the splenic finger, and that in some mysterious way there was a direct relationship between the etheric field of the spleen and the emanations from the magnetic poles of the little finger. If it was the emotional ether that was disturbed through the liver, he put a ring of an entirely different material, tin, on this little finger of the right hand, which he found to be the liver finger. Now, it's quite impossible for us to assume that there are liver fingers and gall thumbnails and things of that nature. <laughs> that gets us into a little bit of complication. But, let us recognize that man is this tremendous electromagnetic field that currents meet, mingle, separate and have their numerous courses throughout him at all times. We know, for example, that the hand has always been directly associated with life, with vitality. Perhaps due in part to man's mental association. Today and for ages, the hand has been the servant of the mind. The hand must, therefore, be in some way capable of a full interpretation of the compound requirements of the four ethers. And the ancients discovered that this was possible through the four fingers, and that the mysterious fifth ether, or kasher of the Hindus, was the thumb. And that, symbolically, these fingers, by their natural motions, uh, by their structure, by their coloration, by their nails, by the markings upon them, were in some way directly related to the basic energy fields of the human body. This may not seem quite so unreasonable if you assume it to be possible that the character and destiny of individuals can be read from their lines in the hand. Cairo, Count Harmon, believed this was because it was a, an artery which went directly from the heart to the hand and therefore that the hand as the particular symbol of man and his purpose. For man became man when he created a hand. That this particular purpose became psychosomatically symbolized throughout his magnetic structure. And that therefore practically every type of energy in the body converges into the hands. Because these, of all parts of man, are most subtly responsive. If you have ever watched the fingers of a great musician, you will realize the tremendous, incredible control which direct thought, without conscious volition, has upon the hands. With such control, it is not unreasonable either to assume that certain Hindu physicians diagnose patients by simply inviting them to sit down and talk with them. The, patient then watch, the doctor then watches the patient's hands and by his gestures diagnoses the ailment and can tell almost any problem that arises simply by which finger the man moves first, in what direction, and what the gesture may be. Because the gesture in some way is a revelation of the total life of the person. Thus the ether is infinitely stamping its total message on everything, on every drop of blood, on the iris of the eye, 
into every hair. This is if it was not for this tremendous uh, totality of etheric distribution, man would not have the power of speech. He would not be able to transmute almost instantly thought into a verbal structure. He would not be able to control intuitively all of the sensory perceptions and faculties which he possesses. Thus, ether is forever active, forever carrying the message. And one of its attributes is said to be that of a living photographic plate, for it is forever photographing purposes and projecting them upon structures. And through this constant projection, the etheric body maintains the tremendous intensity of activity which we call physical life. A very intricate and wonderful process. A process with which we can cooperate by attempting to preserve the relaxation and integration of the body in order that it may respond with, um, without necessary compulsion to any instinct or impulse of the etheric energy. And also by training the person in the body not to issue commands or demands that are unreasonable. If these two ends are met, then ether will continue to impress the person upon the body symbolically and maintain the body as a constant and consistent instrument of that purpose. So through, through ether, the physical body of man becomes a living thing and as such becomes the instrument of the destiny of the person that lives within it. I think that's enough for one warm evening. <laughs>